Good morning, everyone. We'll wait a few minutes until everyone has joined us. I can see the participant numbers are slowly ticking over. Right, I might get things kicked off. Um, welcome to GLNC's webinar on sustainability in action, learnings from horticulture. My name is Charlotte Strand. I'm the marketing and communications manager at the Grains and Legumes Nutrition Council. The Grains and Legumes Nutrition Council uh, looks at industry uh, holistically from the farmer right through to the plate. And in doing so, we're really investigating the nutrition of what it means um, for our consumers, but also what it means for our planet. And we feel like sustainability is really falling into that. Um, I would like to firstly recognise the Wajat Noongar people on which um, in WA, Perth, where I'm presenting from, their um, custodians of the land, past, present and future. I'd firstly like to introduce to you our speaker of the today, um, Gilad Saden. So Gilad is the general manager of Nabi Co. Um, and Gilad professes himself to be a packaging hippie, and I'm sure he'll do a bit of an intro to himself as well. Gilad and I uh, work together really closely in horticulture. And through my time in horticulture, which I worked with previously to GLNC, I could see that there was such unity when it came to the sustainability messaging across the industry. And I thought what better person to contact than Gilad to talk about what the grain and legume industry can really learn from horticulture and how we can bring that forward to consumers and how you can put that into practice in your businesses. So we're really looking at what it means and how it can actually be tangible in your businesses. So I'll kick things off to you, Gilad. Uh, welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. I probably should probably say namaste, considering you called me a packaging uh, hippie. I, um, I've been in the packaging and the horticultural space for coming up to 18 years now. And there's never been a time that sustainability has been more in the forefront of conversation. And I'd like to share with you some of the experiences that I've experienced in the last couple of years, specifically around COVID and specifically how sustainability manifests itself in action as opposed to um, in just high level conversation. So I, um, I will start by sharing my screen and we'll get started. Right, so sustainability in action, sustainability is a very in topic at the moment. And we can clearly see um, that sustainability sells. We, we're seeing examples of sustainability from various uh, parts of our lives, whether it's through a sneaker shop that brands uh, sneakers as sustainable, whether it's a sustainable and ethical blanket, and whether it's sustainably sourced cocos. It seems to be that just using the word sustainable um, resonates with consumers and gives them a certain warm and fuzzy cozy blanket type of feeling but when you ask people specifically what sustainability is what sustainability means to them then this kind of emoji comes up is i don't know i don't really um i don't really uh, give it too much thought and it seems to be that um, every meeting or every conversation that takes place with the big retailers, if the word sustainability is not said at least 15 times, then it wasn't a good uh, meeting. So going back BC times, so before COVID times, these images and these messages were really the hot topic where plastic bags are choking turtles and straws are killing dolphins and Greta is person of the year uh, for the Time magazine and national and the environmental issues before COVID were just the most discussed topic uh, everywhere, particularly in the in the retail landscape. Then uh, COVID comes along and suddenly the environment is important but other topics come into it that are just as important as, uh, as the environment, or in, in some cases during COVID, more important than the environment, where um, the virus was roaming the streets, 
and the kids with the runny nose and the boogers has become public enemy number one and therefore everything had to be wrapped uh, two or three times um, in order to protect ourselves from the virus. So that was one side of the equation. Consumers sitting at home, cooking at home, not going out to restaurants, panic buying, and a whole host of other things has increased the amount of in-house uh, domestic food waste considerably. And people were, were actually seeing that they're wasting a lot more food than what they've done before. Previously, when we are on the go and we're in a rush, we don't notice that we're throwing a lot of things out on a Sunday afternoon before we go to the shops again. And when you're sitting at home and when you're cooking at home, and especially when you need to tighten your belt uh, financially, you're noticing that food waste is a, a, an enormous impact and, 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 and it's a big um, spend within the, within the uh, household expenses. And there's still the environmental issues that really haven't gone away. So it's almost like this three-dimensional ping pong of various different interests and various different uh, hierarchy needs of what's pulling in what particular direction. So it wasn't just environmental concerns, it was self-preservation, uh, protecting yourself from the virus, the food waste component in the environment and everything kind of got um, mixed in uh, together with, with everything. So this is a scene uh, from a movie with Van Damme and, and it seems to be that the, the general sentiment towards sustainability, like I said before, is that it's something that needs to be said and it's thrown like chalk in your eyes and everyone's kind of going uh, mad crazy understanding what it means. And I want to showcase and give examples of what sustainability really means um, in practical terms and not just uh, nice uh, corporate words. So growing a sustainable brand, why we're we doing it, what does it look like? There's a statement here and I put a dotted line there because every company I think can insert their own brand and their own name there specifically because the, the messages are fundamentally true to every business that cares about uh, these things. Insert name of the business is actively committed to environmental sustainability, striving to understand how to reduce the impact and the footprint and teaming up with people throughout the supply chain as well as the consumers themselves. And I think the main, the main message moving forward is that sustainability is not a siloed exercise by a particular company, but more a holistic approach throughout the entire supply chain with a circular mindset in mind, taking the consumer first and what they're looking for and what they are interested in and really providing them with that solution that ticks all these boxes. So why, why should we do it? it increases the awareness uh, to environmental issues, to climate change, to emissions, to water scarcity, to recycling, to ocean plastics. And those are fundamentally issues that are relevant for every industry, not just the hot industry. There's a lot of regulations that are coming in, governance, compliance, roadmaps, uh, expectations from the retailers, expectation from uh, the UN with its sustainability goals. There's a push from the retailers because they identify that the consumers are looking for these things, there's a push uh, uh, downwards to the supply chain to actually act and do and do some things about the environment and environmental issues. And when you do it, uh, when you do it poorly, there's a big reputational risk, and there's a social license, specifically with larger companies. There's a certain expectations for them to do the right thing, specifically with public listed companies, investors and the public alike are looking for those big uh, leaders in the industry to see what they are doing um, to better the environment. What is the uh, business case and why should we do it? This sustainability these days is driving a competitive advantage. You're able to go and see your retail partners uh, with something that is more sustainable and more innovative and get in front in the queue with someone that is just coming to present the same thing over and over again. And there are other opportunities there other than innovation. There's the ability to reduce costs by applying um, sustainability innovation. And 
increasing brand loyalty where consumers are going towards your brand as opposed to your competitors' brand specifically because they perceive your brand as more sustainable. What I'm seeing and what a lot of my clients are seeing these days is that uh, previously in, in, in years past, sustainability and environmental related issues was something that was discussed at the back of the shed with procurement related people. And then it kind of moved in into the C-level uh, suite of executives. And then it became that sort of topic. And what we're seeing now specifically via the retail advertising online and in on TV is that they're actually pushing the 2025 sustainability UN goals towards consumers. So you're seeing an ad by Woolies as an example, that one of the uh, shop managers is holding a cardboard sign that says 2025 and 2025 is becoming the key term that everyone is talking about. What does, what does the roadmap to 2025 look like so there's no uh, particular end goal inside that and, and there's no specific saying by 2025 it has to be this but there's a long journey and an expectations from the retailers for people and their suppliers to demonstrate to them what is their roadmap towards a more sustainable future so how many turtles we're killing now and by 2025 we want to kill less turtles as a very exaggerated example one uh, example, and this is from one of my uh, clients and is uh, in the uh, potato space. Before we go into the packaging examples, there's various different ways of looking at sustainability in a very holistic, well-rounded approach as opposed to just focusing on primary and secondary packaging. And an example for that is the program that we've introduced here. We've actually branded that program and called it Soil Mates, which uh, uh, is a bit of a play on words, but showcasing that sustainability can manifest itself even in growing practices with the use of chemicals and what chemicals are uh, reduced or replaced with others that are less harmful with the uh, water use, with the soil degradation, with the uh, rotation of the, uh, of the crops, cover crops, uh, uh, and a whole host of farming related exercises that ultimately make you a more sustainable and therefore better growers. This example, which we've started two years ago, has actually become a lot more relevant these days, specifically because of the cost increases in inputs from fertilizer to chemicals, to really the need to compensate for those increases by being a better grower, managing your inputs better, increasing your yields, and therefore becoming more sustainable because you're able to maintain or improve your returns and being a better grower that way. So when approaching specifically a packaging, pro, a packaging project, it almost looks more like a crime scene than your crime scene uh, investigation and, and a detective work more than it does a, a, a project management tool because there's so many different factors to take into account whether it's the recyclability of it, whether it's the trends that consumers are looking for, anti-plastic, for paper and cardboard, whether it's people like uh, Greta, that there's a bit of a play on words there that everything moving forward needs to be green, recyclable, earth-friendly, toxin-free, and ultimately affordable. Um, and that's become more, more, more relevant in recent times where inflation is going up and the cost of living is going up. And therefore, there's less justification for costly innovation, but more a supply chain innovation with how uh, more can be achieved with less. I uh, apply a methodology of the three hours of packaging with my client base and my agenda towards packaging. And it's a very simple, straightforward one of remove, reduce, and replace, and I'd like to give you some examples of those three silos. The first one, a very simple, straightforward example. If the packaging doesn't add any value to your product, simply get rid of it. There's some examples here uh, that are horrible examples with pre-peeled oranges in Whole Foods in the States and pre-peeled core avocados in, in a retailer in Canada. This, these, these examples are a few years old, 
but they demonstrate how ludicrous some of those packaging choices are. The social media backlash against those companies has been huge and they've tried to uh, give an appropriate answer. And the example with the oranges was that they were doing it uh, for people with arthritis that found it difficult to peel the oranges themselves. And after they've come up with that comment, then there were uh, tens of thousands of comments uh, to, um, to shame them with how ludicrous their commentary was. And they simply deleted those lines and rightfully so, and never to be introduced again. So if, if there's no value and there's clearly no value in what you're seeing here, other than simply putting a barcode on potentially, uh, get rid of it or don't do it in the first place. The other silo is the reduced silo and it's simply using less. Using less is better for the environment, first and foremost. And secondly, it's better for your bottom line. If you're taking specifically the examples here of taking a plastic clamshell, which is two pieces of plastic and substituting it with a plastic and film on the top, you're simply halving the amount of plastic that you're using. Therefore, the weight is reduced. Therefore, you're using less plastic and you're paying for it less. The good byproduct of that you see on the right-hand side is the PR and the positive PR that comes out of it that a company can say and state and comment, we are removing this amount of plastic from the supply chain, therefore we are more sustainable and being able to benefit from an improvement in the image as well as an improvement in the bottom line. Another, another example is changing from uh, plastic and into cardboard. Driscoll's is a huge berry, the largest berry company in the world. And you're seeing that the commentary that they're putting there is that they're using 94% less plastic and that's just the beginning. And you see that there's a great feel good, uh, warm and fuzzy tree hugging um, messages there with a nice kid uh, thinking about their future uh, in our world. So it's not just the exercise itself and how it's presented to the retailers, it's the exercise and how it's presented to the consumers that is just as important in this process. One of the things that is very uh, noticeable in recent times is that the hierarchy of messages on pack has changed and environmental messages have really uh, inched their way up the list to become a lot more uh, prominent and a lot more noticeable for consumers. And some of the examples you can see on the left, there, a, uh, a planet for mini cucumbers that has um, an embossment on it that says that it actually contains recycled bottles. Then we've got examples of New Zealand kiwis that the planet is actually using New Zealand recycled plastic. So there's a, there's a mention there of a circular economy of such, whether it's FSC logos that are now becoming uh, a lot more commonplace in packaging for a stewardship council for every tree that we chop, we plant another one. An additional message that you can see printed on brown, giving you that earthy, uh, uh, feel good kind of design. The next one that I want to talk about is the silo of replace, because it seems to me that everyone in the industry is looking for just that solution that is going to solve all of the world's problems, including hunger, and they're just looking to replace from one to the other, and all the problems are going to uh, be resolved. And it's simply not uh, the case, and I'll, I'll expand on that in a few minutes. But replace as an example, and this is a project that I've done uh, recently with a large apple grower and Coles, is taking the BOPP non-recyclable or red cyclable bags to the return to store scheme and substituting them and replacing them with a cardboard punnet, 100% plastic free, fully recyclable, made from recycled products uh, uh, with all the right inks and glues, etc. It looks and presents really well. It tells a nice story of the farm and the providence and the tree uh, and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And we've put some tractor designs on the side. So it's taking that crate through the, it looks beautiful. It was very well received. But one of the actual comments that came out of this and it was a, a, a big learning from everyone is with that particular 
variety with Granny Smith being your stock standard budget range to put into your lunch boxes or into your pies, people were thinking that the packaging looked too expensive, was adding too much cost. And the ones that were looking for the budget range of products actually prefer the plastic bag from a perception of uh, a, a budgetary standpoint, even though they were sold for the same price per kilo as what the bags are. So it's interesting to capture and understand what the consumer's perception is compared to the reality, compared to what consumers are saying, as opposed to what consumers are doing. And when you're asking the question, would you buy more sustainable packaging if it was presented to you? There's a resounding yes. If the question is, would you pay more for sustainable packaging? then the answer uh, uh, changes and whatever people are saying and what they're doing at the till in most cases are two completely different things. Going back to one of the original slides with food waste, food waste from an environmental standpoint is a much greater environmental issues than what packaging waste is in itself. The, the, the solution to world hunger is reducing food waste. There's enough food globally for, for everyone to be fed, but there is a, 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 a incorrect distribution of those resources. But packaging specifically can aid reducing food waste considerably, whether it's in the grower side of things, whether it's in the retailer side of things, or whether it's in the consumer side of things, specifically with topics such as increased consumption via education and recipes, via total crop utilization by being able to pack produce that otherwise wouldn't have been able to be packed because of specifications and so on. And the ability to extend shelf life, whether it's at the retailer's shelves or whether it's the consumer household with packaging that actually makes your product last longer, therefore you discard less of it, therefore you eat and consume it, have a better experience and potentially come back to consume it and purchase it again. There's some wonderful examples, uh, specifically with packaging. There's avocados here that there's two companies, one in the UK and one in America, that the smaller avocados weren't even being picked off the trees because they weren't uh, delivering the appropriate returns for the growers. They've done a bit of a consumer research to understand that the way people consume avocados is cut it in half, eat half of it, and then watch the other half go brown in the fridge. And saw an opportunity there to take the smaller size avocados, turn them into a single serve uh, offering, put a very attractive brand over it, let alone the very attractive packaging, uh, like the egg carton pulp uh, packaging and turn it into a monster success, both in the States and in the UK, where people are looking for those uh, six mini single serve, you eat one, you consume all of it, and you just discard the, the, the peel, let alone other opportunities that are ripe and ready to eat, eat one now, uh, and eat one in a couple of days time. So a wonderful example of understanding where the need is from the grower standpoint, from the consumer standpoint, where packaging and brand fits into it, and a very well executed uh, solution. Another, another example um, with my grower, Ray Gem, uh, with potatoes, with the, with the example from earlier, specifically throughout COVID, specifically throughout lockdowns with restaurants being shut with an enormous amount of uh, food that gets redirected from the food service trade, we found an avenue to offer that value to consumers, especially at a time that they, that they were cooking at home and there was a great degree of panic buying, to put it in a brown paper bag, dirty spuds, unwashed spuds that last longer because of that. So they, the, the, the actual film or skin of dirt protects them for longer and makes them last longer, promote the best in season uh, attributes of it, and really an enormous billboard in the middle of the supermarket promoting the value for money, 10 kilos for 10 bucks, um, and, and, and away you go. So uh, again, taking all those boxes from the packaging to the brand, to the providence, to the message, to the value, to what consumers are wanting. And interestingly enough, through COVID, these 10 kilo bags sold well, 
even in affluent suburbs where traditionally those types of uh, packs are sold in the in the budget stores, but we saw good sales in um, in other suburbs as well. Another example from New Zealand when when COVID hit, this particular grower client um, was growing an enormous amount of restaurant quality ingredients for the food service. And when everyone went into lockdown, those restaurants uh, didn't, didn't take any of that produce and we needed to find a quick solution and an avenue to make sure that the food waste uh, doesn't occur and that we don't just discard the enormous amount of produce that was coming. Came up with a piece of packaging that was able to uh, range the product standing upright on the shelf we put the plate and the fork on both sides to really demonstrate that the um, the fruit the, that the vegetables are the hero placed in the center of the plate, together with recipes on the back of the pack for consumer education, inspiration, chef inspired, and we're really able to tie the food service and the chefs that were unemployed at the time to generate a series of recipes to go on the back of the pack to be sold at the at the retail shelves with an emphasis on food waste reduction that this otherwise would, would have gone to um, cattle feed. And we're offering the consumer the ability to enjoy real um, gourmet restaurant quality ingredients. This is another uh, recent example with Vital, which is a brand of Costa um, that we've taken the premium, um, the premium angle, 700 grams of autumn crisps, in a pack that reduces the amount of plastic by two thirds, giving us the ability to have a, a brilliant, brilliant canvas to be able to promote all the um, messaging and selling really well at stores. People really gravitate towards that compared to the other options that are in a plastic um, clamshell. And one of the examples uh, that you're seeing here and it's very relevant in horticulture that there's a certain expectation that you come up with a product and the product will just sell itself where really the the commitment to to promoting the product and doing in-store demos is really part of what the the supplier has to do in order to promote their product and making sure that it sells as well, and that's some of the in-store demos that you're seeing on the side there. Uh, one of the final examples is, um, is another stone fruit grower from Swan Hill that we wanted to find an avenue to take the flat peaches or the donut peaches, UFO peaches as they're called, and promote it in a way that is really appealing to kids and really uh, doing justice to the, not only the delicious variety, but to unique shape and size of the variety and came up with packaging that was able to um, not, on, not only highlight how wonderful the product looks, but giving the consumer, specifically kids, the ability to repurpose the packaging, therefore giving it another lease on life. And they were able to take and remove some of the uh, cutouts on the side, color them in, from a brand, uh, from a brand recall standpoint, this was uh, this was very successful because they were able to um, to keep and hold on to. This is my beautiful daughter did that, and you're able to see that the brand stays with the consumer much longer than what the packaging um, after the produce is being consumed and the packaging is being recycled. So, other than uh, remove, reduce, and replace, there's another R that is um, repurposing. And by repurposing and giving the, uh, the packaging a new lease on life, you're actually further justifying it and consumers are more willing to accept something that has packaging in it because it's got the ability to be repurposed. Interestingly enough, out of all industries, horticulture is the one that gets put under severe scrutiny with packaging. And that's the industry that benefits the most from the use of packaging through the extended shelf life and the protection of the product. Where if you're looking at some of the snacking uh, crackers or biscuits, there's a multiple amounts of packaging there, whether it's a bag that packs 10 or 15 grams uh, into a box and into another bag and, in, and so on and so forth for the convenience of the consumer. That doesn't seem to be scrutinized, although horticulture gets heavily scrutinized um, 
by using packaging. And then another example of maybe using packaging without using packaging altogether, where there's technology available these days that you can actually brand pieces of fruit and vegetables with using um, very accurate, precise lasers, doesn't use any ink, and you're actually able to turn the skin of the product into a piece of packaging. So you're actually branding it without using any additional packaging. And it's very relevant for the organic space where organic at the moment uh, in retail, specifically through the uh, need to reduce teal theft and people running products as organic uh, or non-organic when they are organic products, there, there's a great uh, uh, conflict between organic product that needs to have the least amount of packaging in the consumer's eyes and it now has the most amount of packaging in order to showcase that it is organic and people uh, not stealing it necessarily. And this is a wonderful example of how you're able to do so without using any packaging whatsoever. So that in a, in a, in a nutshell is um, sustainability in action in the horticultural space. I hope I've given a, a well-rounded holistic approach to, uh, to how I view sustainability. And I'm keen to hear your comments and what you have to say. Thanks very much, Gilad. Um, fantastic presentation. I hope that um, people online found it beneficial looking at sustainability from a different perspective. I know there are a few little nuggets of um, wisdom in there that, I mean, even looking at some of the category reports that GLNC are writing at the moment, as you said, in the snacking category, there's certainly a lot of overlap. We did have a question from Catherine Saxelby. Um, so this was on your farming project. She said, um, do you need to remove all the glyphosate? We've heard the, about the harm, harmful effects, but do you need to remove it all or is a little bit okay? Do you have any insight into the decision to do that? Look, I, I am a marketing person and certainly not an agronomist, so I'll be, I'll be reluctant to answer it altogether. But really the exercise there was to find better alternatives to the chemicals that are being used now while not compromising the quality of the produce that is being produced and not compromising the yields that you're able to get out of it. But there's some harmful chemicals like S7 from memory that we were simply looking to uh, remove specifically because not, not only from a consumer standpoint, they're very harmful and dangerous to the operators that are applying that type of uh, chemical. So that was very much from a care to the operators as well as to the consumers. We were looking to remove and reduce some of the uh, harmful chemicals that are being used. And this would also be a reminder if we do have um, brands on the call as well, to look at your entire supply chain. So we're not just looking at packaging and although we, we have focused the last half of the presentation on packaging, where are you getting your, your raw ingredients from? Are they coming from the most sustainable point of view? Uh, it, does that go all the way to the farm? Or are you just accepting at face value that that brand or the, your supplier has your interests at heart? So really to look at what's happening from the farm right through to on pack. Um, I wanted to ask you about innovation in packaging because I noticed that um, one of your products did win the Innovation in Packaging Award. Obviously, we work with a product. So if we're working with bread, for example, it has a really short shelf life. We know that the bread waste is massive in Australia. Is there anything that you've noticed that possibly could apply to, um, I mean, bread is a bit of a difficult one because it's got a shelf life of a couple of days, but perhaps something like cereal, for example. Often we hear brands say, well, we have to use packaging because it has to be plastic because it has to be sealed and to extend the shelf life and maintain freshness because consumers don't want a soggy cornflake or a soggy wheat thick or whatever it happens to be in the morning. Is there something that you've come in and seen in the innovation space that you think, wow, that'd be really good as a cross-functional packaging solution? Some of, um, specifically around bags, there's great examples of packaging that is resealable. So in various different ways and, and various different approaches, whether it's just applying 
an additional sticker onto the packaging itself. So when the consumer opens the bag of cereal, as, a, as an example, they can just bunch it up afterwards and actually apply a sticker on the top of it. You see it with rice, that's quite common. And really it's the ability to reduce the oxidization of the product. So oxygen being the ones that causes it to uh, uh, break down and, and to go uh, soggy, et cetera. So if you're able to slow that down, Therefore, you're able to, um, to extend the shelf life of it. Interestingly enough, the whole topic of extended shelf life in hort is really a double-edged sword because if you're speaking to a lot of the growers, they have this mindset and a perception that if a product goes off, therefore the consumer will be coming back to purchase more of it. So it's actually beneficial that the product doesn't last as long as it could potentially where I think it's fundamentally wrong to think that way. If the consumer has a better eating experience with the product and they actually have been able to use and consume all of it, they are more likely to come and purchase that again, as opposed to something that after a couple of days became moldy and they needed to discard of it. So I think shelf life extension in various different ways is really uh, a key to reducing food waste and a key to becoming more sustainable, let alone, uh, you know, packing product that has a slightly different specification to what it is currently. I think that's a long-term discussion with the retailers, what consumers' expectations are as far as quality is concerned, as far as blemishes and, and marks is concerned. There's an enormous amount of produce that gets discarded at farm level because it doesn't meet specifications. You know, the, the example of the single server avocado is one thing, but there's, you know, tons and tons of product that gets discarded every year uh, because it might have some marks and some, um, and some uh, blemishes. That's why we're seeing an enormous increase in the popularity of, of companies like Second Bite and, uh, and Food Bank, for example, um, where, where there's nothing wrong with the product and it can be used and it can be used to feed hungry uh, mouths of uh, Australian consumers. So I think that that is a topic that is not, as, not addressed with the, with the degree of uh, importance that it, that it requires. And whose responsibility do you think it is? Because obviously I know being in the food industry, we often say, oh, it's a retailer, it's a retailer. You speak to the retailer and they say, oh, well, it's the consumer and it's what the consumer wants. So what, who do you think owns it? Or, you know, you speak to the retailer and they might say government and government says, oh, no, it's industry. And it's just this big circular, I suppose, situation of I know, not blame, but almost saying, well, actually, it's, it's not us. It's because the companies do this or it's because the retailers do this. Do you think it's one person that should own their responsibility and own us? Or do you think it's a shared play? I, I think that um, it's been very convenient to date to play this bouncy, bouncy game of it's not me, it's him. Uh, she'll be right. If it's not broken, don't fix it kind of uh, mindset. And it's not our responsibility. It's the one that sells it or the ones that consumes it. I think what, um, you know, pre-COVID, we were living in an environment in a world that was either or, black and white, on, off. And now the experience of the last two and a half years has taught us that we are living in a world of as well as this plus this plus this plus this. Therefore, it's the responsibility of the consumer as well as the retailer, as well as the grower, as well as the seed provider, as well, as well, as well, as well. And everyone needs to really um, and not, not, not sounding like a, like a hippie from the 60s, uh, everyone needs to sit, sit together in a circle and sing Kumbaya and hug a tree. But really, if we don't get behind this together, all of us, really nothing is going to change. And I think people are realizing that, you know, there's a finite amount of resources on earth at the moment. And we can't just keep consuming more and more and more and more and dump it out the other side and let someone else worry about it. Like, you know, this is it. It is upon us. There's nothing like a good crisis <laughs> to, uh, you know, Winston Churchill said that you can't let a good crisis go to waste. And I think this is the, per the perfect example of that, where we do not have any other choices. We have to come up with a better way of doing it. Yeah, I definitely think, I mean, we've all seen everyone in the entire industry has seen how much COVID has really shaken everything up from, you know, as you mentioned, panic buying right through to 
all of a sudden wanting their produce wrapped because they don't want kids to be touching the apple that they're about to eat at home. Well, I think that about wraps us up for the day. If anyone does have any other questions, um, we will be circulating Gilad's details post the event. We'll also be sharing all of these slides um, and we'll be sharing Gilad's details. So if you don't know where to start on your packaging journey and you're thinking, we're at a loss, we don't even know where to go, from a marketing perspective, right through to sustainable solutions, um, Navico will be able to help you out. Um, if you do have any questions for GLNC, please re feel free to reach out as well. Thank you, uh, Gilad, for joining us today. It's been a really insightful um, conversation. And thank you. thank you for everyone joining us online. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.